you really start to see a reflection of yourself when you have kids. And um, the habits that you really appreciate about yourselves and a lot of the habits that you don't appreciate about yourself. And I really started to look and make a conscious choice that I wanted to, uh, to uh, really bring some of that presence and awareness and mindfulness back into uh, the work that I do. And so that really became the fusion of this conversation for me. And uh, you know, I have a deep commitment to empowering people and organizations, but I have an even deeper commitment that we are excellent with each other, as the line of Bill and Ted's excellent adventure is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the topic of the conversation today is mindful engagement at work and in life. And just to get us started, I want to... This is a 90-minute session, which is a long session for one talking head, so, <laughs> um, especially this talking head. Um, so what I want to do is actually bring some uh, interaction into the conversation. So I'm going to ask you questions, and I really encourage you to participate, raise your hand, or um, you know, in whatever way you can. Um, we're also going to do uh, some practices. So I'm going to pause at certain points in the, in the presentation. Uh, we'll reflect on like the topics that we just covered, and then we'll do either some guided meditation or just like a, a small practice. Most of them aren't more than a couple of minutes. Um, I'd ask you to close your eyes. You can choose to do that or not. Um, but we'll we'll start to make it a little bit more participatory, and I think that way we'll all have more fun. Um, yeah, and, and the invitation is also. Uh, since we are in a conversation about mindfulness, we are in a conversation about awareness, and I'm going to invite you that, like, um, it's not a don't use your technology conversation, but if you are going to tweet, if you are going to be uh, using your, your iPad or what have you, you know, just do it with some thoughtfulness, you know, like, do what you're going to do and then be back in the conversation. If you're going to be spending time doing your email or whatever, you know, no judgment, but maybe it doesn't make sense to do it in the room. <laughs> so, um, so let me just ask you guys. I mean, what, what? I'm curious. What had you come to this session? I, mean, I shared a little bit about what had me come to this session. on one thing and do one thing and just be there. Like, I'm more productive that way. However, I've noticed that you get patted on the back for being the creams, like, oh my god, I have so much to do, I have to go here, I have to do this, I'm full of Like, you get rewarded for being that kind of crazy, frantic person, but it doesn't work in terms of, like, getting things done. So, yeah, so that's... Exactly. And so, it sounds like both of you are kind of advocates in your own organization. You see, you have a deeper sense of what you want to bring when you're in an organization that is operating at different speed. Uh, that reminded me, I saw one of those Facebook pictures. It said, stop the glorification of busy. And I was just like, oh. I, just saw, I saw some other hands. Yeah, great. Cool. So both sides of the spectrum. 
uh, my organization actually teaches mindfulness in schools um, throughout the world uh, in different languages. And, and I, I feel like I mentioned it, but at the recent Wisdom 2.0 conference, uh, Marianne Williamson was speaking, and it was like really a call to action yes. from everybody that's practicing mindfulness to actually start taking action through mm -hmm. nonprofit organizations or whatever you can do. And so I, I was kind of stoked to see this <laughs> session here. It's sort of like that, because I get sort of, you know, at Wisdom 2.0, it's just a different <coughs> thing, but it's so much, I call it mindful masturbation, where it's like, we're so great because we do <coughs> yoga and all these other things, but they're not taking action. And so I think it's cool to like, like encourage other nonprofits to be able to take that action within the organization and also in their teaching. So. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I think, uh, so bookmark that for a second. <coughs> If you haven't seen that talk, um, Wisdom 2.0 conference, Marianne Williamson. It's on the 2003 videos. It's about 2013. 2013. <laughs> uh, uh, she uh, she gave this speech on the last day of the conference, which was such a powerful call to action. Um, it is a must-watch video if you are doing this kind of work and you're committed to this conversation. It's been a revolutionary. And you'll probably notice a lot of the themes. I, uh, a lot of my inspiration comes from Dan Siegel, who does uh, neuroscience, interpersonal neurobiology. Um, Marianne Williamson, a friend and someone who like is really um, supporting me in this. Uh, a lot of some of this. Uh, there's some meditation practices from Jack Kornfield, One of them that I stole directly from that conference. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, very much, uh, this is a stone soup of a lot of those inspirations, and of many others, which I'll cover. So, um. Um, I, I definitely find that doing IQ stuff, not just a change management, but the people's capacity to sort of do their own life hacking, their calendaring, and all that stuff, that's like their biggest obstacle, and I feel like our, our biggest problem with getting stuff done is not you know, the lack of funding. But it's that they're just drowning with their smartphone and their kids and all that kind of stuff. And so I, I've been leading a meditation every day, and occasionally I've done like improvisation games. And I'm lucky enough to have support for my boss to do that. And and my my coworkers are all very metric focused, and I've like shown them the brain research that says you will be more productive if you don't eat your lunch at your desk. Right. But they but getting them to step away from their desk and do the stuff. Is, big part of it is like we know there's a there's a higher self or the inner self that knows this stuff and, and, and but it's how do you change those habits you know like that are automatic like this um i didn't put in improv is awesome that, that's, that's something i didn't include in this so that's great i would like to connect with you a little more about that yeah. i'm really interested in how my own mindfulness and, and trying to be mindful at work um, also um, informs how I engage with community. Because I'm I'm not an IT person, so don't throw apples or something <laughs> at me, everybody. But I'm more of a community organizer, and I just went to an event recently called Embody Deep Democracy, and a lot of activists, people who are really committed to social justice, get burnout um, because we know. Uh, how hard it is, like what's happening in communities, how bad it is for people, and we want to just commit our whole lives to it. We, but we also have to be humans ourselves. We also have to live our own lives and not only just sacrifice who we are for the, the passions that we have, and, and that's a really hard balance. So trying to see that um, be employed in all those different areas and remain human, um, I think is a challenge, and I wanted to hear what you had to say to make it easy for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think um, the preventing burnout, especially of activists and community organizers and people that are, I mean, it's, it, it goes beyond that. I think that's kind of the canary in the coal mine, and now it's like we're seeing it on all aspects of all jobs, you know, because we're always on, and everything is a fire that we're putting out, and it's always critical, and you know, we don't turn off our devices. So I think. Yeah, that's a big part of this. You know, I mean, I think that's one of the that's one of the values of what we get out of having this conversation. So let me take one more if there is. And, yeah. 
I just found that I can either be all on, like crazy go, connected in every way, tweeting, blah, 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 or completely off, like I'm going to go to South America for two weeks and not touch technology, and right. there's no in between. Yes. And just how to t- take, come to a happy place. Yeah. Plus one on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I, I, um, I recently got went to a, a three days, didn't have internet access, and it was like on the third day, I was like, oh my gosh, I remember myself. Like, here I am. Like, and then all of a sudden, like, you flooded back to the internet. So, cool. Well, I think that gives me a good sense of kind of like the, the vibe of the room, and I think we're very much all in the same place. And so, I'll orient uh, my comments towards. Um, what you want, and again, you know, let's make this a little bit interactive and have some participation. And if there's anything that's um, you know, anything that you want to contribute, you know, please do. Could so, you do people fill in that empty chairs outside? Yeah, so there's like a couple, like three or so chairs here, two chairs there. If you guys, there's some people standing in the back. So when I think about this, you know, what do we want? You know, I think we want to be happier. I think we want to be healthier, more more productive lives, more fulfilling lives. We want to do what's really important to us. And, you know, most of us in this, you know, what would have us be at a nonprofit technology conference is that we, you know, our job is to contribute to others having healthy, happy lives. That's what, that's why we're all here. Um, so that's really like the spirit in which, you know, I think that we want to have this conversation. And I think we could all agree that we are in an absolute poverty of attention. Um, we have more access to information than we ever have, um, which makes this conversation even more important. Um, we're more connected to more and more people than we ever have. But at the same time, we're having less and less present time with each other. So the question is, how can we be present and constantly plugged in? Is that even possible, I think, to your point? Um, to me, that's really the question of our age. Uh, and it's really what I'm passionate about. So I find myself, I shared this a little bit earlier, uh, I'm constantly on my phone. and. Uh, and it's it's gotten worse over the last couple of years. I've noticed. Like I'm, I'm more, I give myself more permission to uh, use that as a space. I mean, even this morning, I noticed today when I went to an elevator and I was only going up a few floors and I was only going to have ten seconds or so, and somehow that became an invitation for me to grab my phone and make sure I wasn't missing something, right? And, you, and I'm sure you guys have this experience too. And in fact, if you actually become present to it, you start to look around, uh, we're pretty much all doing that. I mean, we're, we're not spending that time, any quiet time anymore with ourselves. Of course, there's exceptions. You guys probably make exceptions to that rule. But by and large, you know, that's really what's happening. Uh, in, in, in a way, technology has moved faster than our ability to have a dialogue about this, you know, to even make a choice about it. Like, when did we have the conversation that we should all be expected to have email on our cell phone? I mean, like, we missed that. Like, it just all of a sudden happened. Like, what? You, you had that conversation? Yeah. Yeah. See? And, yeah, that's <laughs> Anybody else not have a cell phone? <laughs> yeah, and so, uh, well, he, and here's where I think we're at. I mean, and, and you might be the, the start of this, is I think this is the time to pause and actually have that conversation. Because it's not going to get slower. We can already see the acceleration of what's going to happen. I mean, I guarantee you, by the time we come back to this conference next year, there's going to be people, attendees, wearing Google Glass and have an augmented reality experience. And then in three years from now, we all might be expected to have Google Glass, right? Where we're, we're, I mean, this is, this is how it's moving. So this is really an opportunity for us to pause and for us to bring this conversation into our, um, 
into our organizations. So I believe that gaining control is really the, the number one challenge here. You know, gaining control of this conversation. So, so this is the agenda of what I want to go over. Um, first, I want to talk about like what is the mind and what is the brain. Like from a actual biological perspective, why you know how does this conversation play into it? I think that there, we might glean some knowledge from that. Um, talk about what mindfulness is, what I mean by mindfulness, what other experts I say, what other, what experts think of it. I wouldn't consider myself in that. Uh, and then how we could uh, apply this to work, how we could apply it in our own lives, and uh, get into some resources. Uh, I also want to give myself permission to stray from the agenda if it actually makes sense and it serves you know, the conversation that we're having, the dialogue that we're having. So, so let's just step back for a second. I think this is a really interesting question. What is the mind? Talking about mindfulness, talking about the mind. Does anybody know what the mind is? It's a big old shell. <laughs> <Yeah>. Right? It's <laughs> a good definition. Um, anyone else? A scientist trying to figure that out. They don't know what the mind is. They don't know what the brain is. Yeah, exactly. Like I heard that they, at the wisdom conference, this is one of the hard questions, yeah. which means. <laughs> <laughs> We're not exactly sure. Um, you know, is it biological? Is it scientific? You know, can we split it out like a scientific conversation? Um, is it actually a spiritual conversation? Does it actually not have anything to do with science? Is there some place where they merge? Um, you know, I think it's a really good question. Uh, for the purposes of this conversation, uh, I took the, the definition... Uh, from the field of interpersonal neurobiology, which is actually uh, a combination of a whole lot of uh, disciplines that include neuroscience and biology and the I always stumble at this word contemplative sciences, <laughs> um, and it's it's really looking at you know looking at all the different truths from all these different disciplines and kind of coming up with some unified answers or where they um, Dan Siegel, who's Dr. Dan Siegel, is a, um, someone who I believe coined this term, uh, and he, uh, one of his core beliefs in this dialogue is that the formation of neurons and neurological links of the mind are always continuing to grow in the brain, right? So we have a constantly evolving brain. And uh, and that's a new that's a newer uh, theory that I mean only in the last like, fifteen or twenty years that we we used to think that the mind stops growing at a certain point and part of interpersonal biology is that uh, that there's an idea of neuroplasticity that like the mind is always changing and adapting. However, the mind is not the brain, so. I want to make a distinction here. Distinctions are really important because they give us a lot of power, right? Like, if you drink wine and you only drink, and your distinction is red, white, red wine or white wine, you know, but you're limited. But if you have distinctions around wine, like a lot of you do, all of a sudden you can have a much deeper conversation about it. So, um, so I want to make a first distinction here that the mind is not the brain. We're not talking about the elect, the electrical connections of neurons here, we're actually talking about something else. Um, so let's talk about first what the brain is, and then we'll talk about what the mind is. So this is your brain. <laughs> this is your brain in NTC. Um, so the brain is really, uh, here's a very generalized, non-scientific way of explaining the brain. Uh, imagine this is the model of the brain. Like um, Here's the brain stem comes up over, and in the back you have the temporal lobe, and that's responsible for memory. And then you come over the, octo the octipital lobe, and that's where like your vision happens. And then the, does anyone know this word? Our parietal lobe, thank you. 
and that's your spatial sense and navigation. Then you have your premodal, your premotor cortex, which is where your movement comes from. Then your frontal lobe, where you have your memory, your task, your motivation, where you set goals and all that. And then you have your prefrontal cortex, right? Like, and that's like the, the farthest. And what's interesting about this model um, is when you, when the brain, the brain kind of grows in this way, and then the prefrontal cortex kind of wraps around and touches the center, like the, this area here. Um, why is that important? This is really cool. <laughs> the brain is made up of 100 billion neurons. 100 billion neurons. And each of those neurons could connect on average to 10,000 other neurons. Right? So the neurons that are in the center are connected to your memory, your spatial, your navigation, your movement. Like, they're the ones that are, like, special in that they have connection to all those others. Um, when you take 10 billion neurons and 10,000 average connections between all of them, they want to know how many connections that makes possible. Someone's on the phone right now. It's 10 times 10, 1 million times, which means... That number is more than the known atoms in the universe. That's how many connections are in the human mind. Right? Um, <laughs> so, let's get back to your brain. That middle prefrontal area that touches everything, the limbic area, the brainstem, the cortex, the representation area, it's responsible for about nine different activities. And those are body regulation, attunement, like when you feel some, you can feel someone else's feelings, right? You emo, your own emotional balance, your response flexibility, how easy it is for you to like not be reactive and have choice in the matter. Uh, your self-knowing, your, uh, like, ex, uh, your fear, uh, extinction, your intuition, and your mortality, like understanding your place in the universe, that you may die, you probably will, uh, but knowing that, uh, you know, all that is where that area happens. So, like I said, this is where it gets really, really cool. So, neuroplasticity is the ability for the mind to reorganize neuro conne neural connections throughout life. The mind doesn't stop developing. It's constantly making new connections, right? As you learn new things, like you have a visualization that happens in the back of your mind, as you have new thoughts that happens in the front of your mind, those make up new thought patterns, and that's what gives your experience of the world. Mindfulness practice we're going to talk a lot about, promotes the growth of all nine of those prefrontal, middle prefrontal cortex areas. But not only that, mindfulness meditators, when they've done studies, monks and other people that are really, that do this work in mindfulness meditation, they have thicker middle prefrontal regions, which means the thicker the better, the more interconnection. And it's actually exactly correlated to the number of hours that they meditate. So not only that, if you're tracking, if you're doing like a brain scan on someone who's doing mindfulness meditation, you can actually see the middle prefrontal cortex area being activated during mindfulness meditation. You can see the neurons and the activity that's going on there. So we know that it also that plays this like this area plays a huge central role. And it means that we have more resonance circuitry. We can feel other people. We have more empathy, uh, open to other people's signals. And we can attune to people. When it, so I, I, mean, I just want to pause. Because <laughs> I think I wouldn't have really gone into the brain stuff too much if I didn't think that this was critically important. Who we are is unwritten, and 
our practice of bringing awareness, mindful awareness and attention could change our way that we relate to the world and the way other people can relate to us. It's scientifically proven. There's a huge amount of studies that are going on right now around this. This is, and by the way, everything that we've learned around the brain in the last 15 years, last 15 years, is more than we've ever known for the last 10,000, all of science, like in the last 15 years. So this is new stuff. Most of us weren't in school when all this has happened, right? And now there's all these studies around mindfulness and science and what, what it can do. So this is, this is awesome, and it's cutting edge. Um, so... Uh, one of the things about mindfulness meditation or mindful awareness, let's say, is that it really is an experience of direct experience, right? It, it, the parts of the brain become more active, like the insula that's like around understanding body sensations, receiving body sensations. And when direct uh, when the direct experience network is activated, you're not thinking about the past or the future or goals, or you're not considering yourself that much in the picture. You're thinking more about your sensations in real time. So the sun on your face at the beach, and you can feel the warmth of it on your skin. That's a direct experience or sensation. Um, breezing your hair, you know, having a cold drink you see where I'm going. Um, so what I want to do here is um, give us an op opportunity to pause and actually check in for a direct experience. Okay. So um, I'm going to invite you all to um, do this for about two minutes. Uh, if you could all um, get in a meditation posture in your chair, which would be more like standing straight up. Um, most important thing I would say is uh, your your back is totally aligned, your spine is aligned, and you're, and you're sitting with a sense of dignity. In fact, I'm going to put your, your invisible crowns and get off your, uh, uh, if you're comfortable with it, I invite you to close your eyes or just have a soft gaze on the ground. And just loosen the muscles in your face your jaw, let your eyes be soft, rest your shoulders, soften the area around your heart, relax, and just settle into the space for now, and begin to bring your attention to your breath. Continue to bring your attention to your breath, you want to come back to your breath, but as thoughts arise, am I, am I doing it right, how long have we been going, or anything that comes up, is this a thought, yes, that's a thought, begin counting how many thoughts that you have, just watch like a cat watching a mouse hole, how many breaths, starting now. Yeah, yeah, I should have said, don't, 
<laughs> that's a whole other, that's a trap you can go down. <laughs> Numbers? You know what? Yeah, it's about a range of like 3, 5, 11. I think for a lot of us, we have longer talks. A lot of us have shorter talks. Catch up easier. Um, anybody notice that they have a more picture like thoughts? Yeah. Some people have picture thoughts. What about like uh, just uh, words? Words. Uh, word thoughts. Yeah. Um, sometimes uh, even like a feeling thought. Like a, a, a visceral thought. Yeah, we all kind of think differently, which is pretty cool. And I mean, we all experience all of them, but we have like primary methods. Um, yes, thoughts are funny. Yeah, thoughts are funny. It's, um, this is this gets back to the whole question about <laughs> the brain, the brain versus the mind, right? Like, is the mind the the subject of the brain, or is the brain the subject of the mind? You know, where did those thoughts originate from? Did they come from the mind? Or was that neural activity that you then witnessed? <laughs> um, so, I want to shift from the mind, you know, thinking about the brain and the mind, and actually get to the conversation of what do we mean by mind? We have a little bit, we know a little bit about what the brain is, how neurons fire, and watching thoughts. What is the mind? Well, this is this definition was developed in 1992 by a team of 40 academics, including Dan Siegel, Dr. Dan Siegel, I mentioned, and it's pretty awesome. The mind is an embodied and relational process that regulates the flow of energy and information. So again, this is not the brain, this is the mind. The mind is embodied, you're in a body. It's relational, it happens with other people. And it regulates, turns on and off, energy, the flow of energy and information. This was agreed to by these 40 academics. Pretty revolutionary in itself, you know, academics. So, um, <laughs> Uh, and it actually gives a lot of space to have conversations about the mind because what we're talking about then is we are in a relational field, right, where energy is exchanged. I speak into a microphone, that microphone you know, comes with speakers, vibrate sound waves, they go into your earlobe that resonates in a particular way, creates brain activity, you then relate you know, regulate that energy and flow information. And we have an embodied experience of it. So we're gonna unpack this really, really deeply. We're not gonna do that too much right now. But so let's talk about this. Mindfulness is our training of awareness and attention. So mindfulness in this context then is a form of brain hygiene, right? Uh, here's a few definitions of what we mean by mindfulness. It could be being conscientious, like being thoughtful, careful, vigilant. It implies, you know, uh, that you want to do a task well. You want to be mindful of this task. Um, Jack Kornfield, who is a, a, a Buddhist teacher and um, also amazing uh, uh, around working around this work, um, he called it. Being present, on purpose, tracking moment-to-moment -moment experience without judgment. Pretty awesome. And other definitions have gone to it's being, uh, it's not coming to premature closure on assumptions or categories. The practice of remaining open. speaks to it pretty well too. The definition that I really like is mindfulness is awareness of what arises in the present moment. 
So we have plenty of training in thinking. We all went to school and we all learned how to think, but we've all pretty much, unless we've taken it on in our own path in some way, have had no practice in awareness. Mindfulness gives us the ability to stop reacting and start responding. Thoughts are not facts. Thoughts create a sort of glass ceiling that keeps us from achieving our goals. They come in the form of, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not confident enough. The trick is, or the practice is, I should say, can you be witness to these thoughts or do you want to let these thoughts run the show? So we're talking mindfulness is bringing attention, mindful attention. Attention of what? Attention of what's happening in the present moment. You know, all the, the only thing that's happening is the present moment. Now, 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 now. It didn't happen in the past. It doesn't happen in the future. That happens in the prefrontal cortex. Direct experience happens in the back of your head where you have representations, representations of the physical world, firing at neurons, experiencing as experience, right? So let's talk about your direct senses. What are your senses? Touch. Touch. Smell. Fear. Taste. Sight. Sight. But, yeah, and all your bodily sensations, right? You know, we, we talk about the five bodily sensations. There's also the sixth sense people talk about. That's like the mental experience. Some people relate to that as intuition, or, but you could also relate to it as your thoughts, right? That's your sixth sense. You know, that's an experience that you're having. You are just, and you are just an experience, a direct experience, counting your thoughts. Um, I'm going to share two more thoughts. Uh, this, these come from the, the Buddhist practices. Excuse me, two more senses. Um, one is consciousness. So consciousness is the knowing capacity. So there's taste, and then there's the knowing of taste. Right? There's a receiver. Of it. There is touching and that that touched, the one that received that touch, right? Does this resonate? Like the consciousness, at some level, you can, that makes sense. And then here's the eighth one. And again, we're diving into a distinction. You know, we might not always talk about this. There is a space that's in between sensation in the awareness, the consciousness of sensation. There's a whole array of inner qualities or mental factors. You know, the Buddhists, some, in some lists they say it's like 52, in some lists it's 108. But they basically determine the quality of relationship to the experience. So you have sight, your consciousness knows it, you hate it, you hate what you're experiencing, you know, in that moment, that determines it. Someone else right next to you has sight, has the consciousness of sight, loves what's happening, has the experience of loving what's happening, right? Does this resonate? You guys, so, so there are unhealthy inner qualities, let's call them unhealthy, and then there's healthy inner qualities. You know, some of the unhealthy ones, and they're only unhealthy because they create suffering. There's no other, you know, no judgment on these qualities, but grasping, addiction, greed, aversion, Aggression, fear, ignorance, worry, self-centeredness, you know, all that kind of, you know, really what it is, is it's, it's, a, it's aversion at its core, you know, it's like not okayness with it, and then that gives the experience of, you know, the quality of that experience. And then on the healthy side, you know, there's, well, there's love, there's wisdom, clarity, Gratitude, generosity, right? And, and all the, those are kind of the primary ones. 
and they give rise to confidence, to graciousness, to flexibility, joy, modesty, clarity, insight, kindness, adaptability, flexibility. You know, so those are kind of like the healthier flavors of sensation. So meditation, and I'll use meditation in a very broad sense here. It's not just sitting with your eyes closed. It's not vipassana meditation or whatever kind of mindfulness meditation. Um, could be walking meditation. Meditation is the tuning is tuning the instrument. So the greatest orchestras in the world need to tune their instruments in order to hum. That's what mindful awareness is. It's the tuning of the instruments to tune in to the quality of those arrays of sensation that give you the experience of joy. <coughs> Again, we'll, we'll do a practice here. So if everyone, again, in your invisible crowns, sitting in your sense of dignity, being the conduit between the great unknown of consciousness and the groundedness of this amazing planet. And we're going to tune into sensation. We're going to tune into direct experience. Invitation is to tune in to your own body's sensation. So your heart, your breath, your skin. Are you holding tension in your heart? Just tune in to your own direct experience. anything that they noticed? What did you notice by just stopping and tuning into your own experience? Is there anything that you didn't expect? Sort of flashback to the wings of me when I was younger, things like that, whenever I stopped um, or thinking about now. you out of that. You know. <laughs> no, but thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yes? So the sense of little surprise is like, oh, wow, here, there's a lot, a lot of noise. Oh, there's a haze. You know, just a lot of different things that I wasn't aware of when I was just listening. Yeah. To you, so it's interesting. Yeah. I, um, thank you. I had the experience yesterday. Um, it was not a pleasant experience. I went to go uh, check into the hotel. I'm a guest on someone else. So we, uh, so, but all that was, I didn't notice all that was there. All I got was like, oh, you're going to have to wait until the end arrives. And, and, I, and I felt this like, really intense rush of emotion. Like, it, was, it felt like anger. Well, I wouldn't say anger is a bodily sensation, but anger to me feels like my forehead gets hot, my shoulders get tense, my belly kind of tightens, I get into fighting mode, and I'm really about to show them. Like, you don't know who you're messing with. <laughs> like, I like to get my way, so I'm about to insist that I get my way. And all that, like, but but I had this interesting walk between 
the, the tram, and when I got to the hotel, I was thinking about my presentation, I was thinking about body sensations, and I was like, kind of in the <laughs> presence of watching my body sensations. So I show up, I have this experience, and instead of kind of reacting from that space, like what I was witnessing was like, ah, ah, you know, like I was feeling like all that kind of build up, build up, build up, but there was a moment where I just had some choice to make, where I was just like, okay, I'm feeling this. Like, I'm about to insist that I get my way in a really angry way. Like, I don't need to do this. Like, and I kind of stepped back, and, and you know, the situation ended up resolving itself in a really um, magical way, actually. It's kind of a funny story, but not relevant to this. <laughs> but, but, um, but it was, uh, you know, it was, it was, I was grateful that I was present and not given by the, not given by my reaction. So I would say, you know, that's really one of the values of mindfulness, you know, that we could, you know, so let's recap for a second. You know, we experience our world through, made, you know, like our narrative circuitry most of the time. Who I am, my identity, my ego, paths that have been blazed and my neurocircuitry, right? And we use a lot of that for like goal planning, you know, planning and goal setting and strategizing and doing all the kind of stuff that we want to do, right? Um, we could also experience the world more directly. You know, we could um, enable that sensory experience. And when we experience more direct experience, you know, we have, we're a little bit more closer to the nature of the reality of an event, right? I wouldn't say we're at in reality, but we're closer, we have a representation of the reality that's happening. The, the, the best reality that you can you can experience, or the, the most accurate representation, is what actually is happening in your own body, right? Because you're the only one, or you're the, you could tap into, my heart is beating fast, that's what's really happening, right? Um, so, and when you notice stuff, in real time, it makes you more flexible on how you respond to the world. So these are a lot of the, the value ideas. You know, we become less imprisoned by the past, our habits, our expectations, our assumptions. We're able to respond to events as they unfold. So I say that there's a lot of value in the work that we do, right? We're constantly in a reaction social media, to our boss, to incoming email. You know, how many of us actually pay attention to how we're sitting, like when we're at our desk? Right? So, you know, having this, there's, there's bringing conscious awareness, you know, could add a lot of value. Attention is the most powerful tool of the human spirit. I wholeheartedly agree. And when we split our attention, we not only undermine our relationships, we remember less and we retain less. We generally just become less effective. I mean, on, when we move from a primary task, we move our attention from a primary task to another one, it adds at least 25% of time. And if you're like me and you, con and you context switch all the time, based on whatever email is in front of me or whatever fire I need to put out, I think 25% is a you know, small number. So there's a whole field that's starting to be discussed around this called sustainable engagement. And there's more than 100 studies about employee engagement and performance. Um, the kind of sustainable engagement is kind of the classification of it. Um, the key is that Work environments that fully energize employees, whether it's their physical, their emotional, their social well-being, what I would also add is their mental and spiritual well-being, and giving them a strong purpose, you know, a strong sense of purpose in, the, in work, is what creates deeper levels of engagement. It's actually what present, it prevents burnout. Burnout is exactly this. When you when you're not supported in your physical, emotional, social, mental, spiritual well-being. And you can only do that for so long before your inner knowing revolts. 
because it can't deal with that. It has to switch. That, that it is a it it is certainly a problem in the nonprofit community. You know, we've seen that for years, but it's becoming more and more of a problem as you know, for a bigger part of the population. You know? And if you and if you're like me and you have kids and you have the stress, you know, all that that comes with that, you know, you have your attention there and you want to manage like your relationship, you know, you want to have a healthy relationship and you pull them that way and your work and taking me time to like do all that kind of stuff. It's so easy to not be in balance with all this stuff, right? So the key here is really knowing your own mind tracks and freeing yourself from the automatic and that's really what, like, the, the middle prefrontal cortex, really, the gift, one of the gifts of it, amongst many, is that, you know, we have choice. That we have, we don't have to be reactive. Animals don't have middle prefrontal cortexes. You know, it was developed, you know, 200 million years ago. In, in mammals, or maybe a little, could be off a bit. But the, the uh, what's a couple million, 100 million years between friends. Um, <laughs> Um, so, you know, we want to, uh, you know, we want to give choice here. So, so let's talk about mindfulness at work. Actually, let me pause. Let me pause. I've been talking a lot. <laughs> and I just want to, let, does anyone have any reflections on what's, what we've talked about so far? Any insights? You know, want to contribute something that, you know, you know about this conversation? I really like your story about getting hot and pretty Scottish, Irish, and German, and Russian. So it's like I can get angry pretty easily. I don't know if anybody else does that, but um, just the how your body reacted and being able to like train yourself to see how your body reacts and how that relates to your health overall and how you relate to your coworkers constituents or whoever you are around, um, I think that's really, that's the value that I see in this is that's really toxic for your body and that's really toxic for your relationships to be in that state and if you can catch it, like how valuable is that?
a lot of what we teach is kind of a blend of mindfulness and positive psychology and neuroscience. And the reason we do that is so we can take it to public schools and we can take it in the places. And I think that that's important for taking into your work as well as to be able to say, these are all these things that have an effect on you, but here's the reason why. And there's actual scientific proof now. You know, Dan Siegel or the two David Stern or all these other people that have done the work to really show that it is, and, and I mean, you touched on it, but it really, like, when you take it out, it's, it's Especially if you have a, an athlete, I, mean, I'm, well, I, I do this and I work with Iowa Foundation, so it's pretty easy for me to, <laughs> to get yeah. this, but, but for, for a lot of places, it's not. It's, it's something that you don't, you have to kind of deal with it, and so it's, it's great to have that to back it up. Like, this really will increase productivity, and, and you know, it, it uh, allows all, a lot of the tech companies around us to have a focus on mindfulness, and it's because it really improves productivity. It was um, uh, one of the big insights for me around this work, and I really dove into it a couple of years ago when I started mindfulness at work. But at the Wisdom 2.0 conference where they had um, Google, and they started introducing mindfulness meditation to Google, and, the, and their invitations to their, I just saw it, like the, the invitations that they sent out to the engineers wasn't come meditate. What they said is, uh, we're going to give a class on high definition sensory awareness. <laughs> <laughs> and then they spent 40 minutes talking about the science of it, which the engineers ate up. And they said it, it, it improves the middle prefrontal cortex neuron transmitter area, right? And so we're going to spend 10 minutes now doing this. And everyone sat. And then the next week, all those engineers came. It's like it spoke to the audience, it spoke to them. And I think it, it, it really, sometimes the science really has to speak to you. Uh, or people have to hear it through the science. Because when you talk about meditation, like when I, my fear when I present something like this, it's like, oh, that's a woo conversation, you know? But it's like, yeah, this is like, it's not a woo conversation. This is like the, the fate of the planet, you know, not get too. <laughs> Grandiose. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's like we uh, we, we operate from uh, we operate from a sickness. You know? We operate from this like this is not sustainable. The go 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 like you're a machine, like you're a computer. Your brain wasn't built like that. It just simply wasn't built like that. And we work in organizations that believe that it was, or have habits and patterns that have just been ingrained. That we get sucked into, and you know, there's an alternative way. So, yeah. I was going to say, uh, in addition to mindfulness at work or mindfulness at work and all, I would just uh, offer the audience the opportunity to practice one of those other concepts, which is you know, handing and facilitating their minds to each other, even though there are other people who can not pay attention to. <laughs> 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 It's all mindfulness, yoga, retreat, you know. <laughs> now, actually, I think a uh, quiet room, though. I mean, I had the advantage of uh, come doing it to speak. There's a, there was one room reserved for speakers to kind of collect their thoughts, do final preparation, and chill out. And that was actually about the most grounding thing I could have had because I spent the morning in there not as much tweaking this, but kind of centering And I think a lot of us, you know, especially by day three, right, where it's just like so much information, you know, and a few drinks. <laughs> <laughs>
so much of this conference is about tweeting during the session mm -hmm. and the kind of competitive comment-driven atmosphere that really is what this conference is about. And so I actually was really pleased when I saw this on the agenda, and I didn't quite believe you were going to be talking about what I thought. <laughs> it seems so antithetical to what we're all supposed to be doing here, which is tweeting and social media interacting and all of that. And it's almost like there is a sense that you aren't tweeting during a session. You're somehow not fully embracing the ethos of the community. Yeah. And I actually, you know, back to when did we ask the question that we should have email all the time? I, when did that become like what we were supposed to think about doing or what social engagement meant? That I couldn't listen to you, I had to tweet or have a comment about what you were saying. Right. I don't know, I just think there's a whole kind of philosophy at this conference, and perhaps in the, obviously in the greater world, that again, makes the question, why is this what we're supposed to, what is it defining the community? Yeah. And, and it's not just this conference. This is like its conferences have this, you know, have this ethos, uh, and it's diff it's it's really difficult as a speaker. I mean, I, I don't speak in many conferences, but I but I but I have empathy for the speakers when they're looking at a whole bunch of people on laptops and on their phones. Like, like why are we doing this, right? Like, if we're not going to be present with each other, why did we fly to Minneapolis? You know, seventeen, you know, hundred of us. To, to then all look at our screens together. You know, like it's ridiculous. But it's. But it's <laughs> um, and uh, I think we can, I think we are the, we're the ambassadors of the conversation, right? Because if we bring it back to the organizations and we bring it to NPN, if we bring it to other conferences that we go to, then it starts to spread. And, you know, it changes the conversation. That's how this stuff happens. You know? Twitter's only six years old, you know, or so. Um, we, this, it's a very new conversation. When cars first came out, there were no rules of the road, right? There was no stoplights, there was no right away. Um, you were dealing with horses and buggies and, uh, and people in the streets and, you know, and we and we created rules of the road, you know, and, and we created seatbelt laws, and we created car seats and all the things that now go in, in, in not texting. I haven't evolved to that point where I can do all those things at once, but you know, I, I see, you know, my ten year old nephew can go on and he'll be doing things and functioning fully. And and what I really try to do is like how can we take mindfulness and use these as a tool for good rather than for um, Use this technology for something that we can actually spread this for good rather than just trying to say, oh, this is horrible, you shouldn't unplug it and do all this. And I think there is a time when you do need to unplug it for a program, which I'm trying to do right now and it's driving me a little nuts. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I think that right now. I haven't tweeted <laughs> <one. laughs> So I, yeah, I mean, that's just, I think that there, there is a way that you can actually use a lot of this technology to promote mindfulness and also use it for good in everything you're doing. There's a, um, a Buddhism teacher in Oakland, and um, so during the day run, what she does is she has everybody bring out their cell phone. And she tells everybody to like pick an obnoxious ring and to set it, and then you know have people call each other and do all this stuff, and then you're meditating while people's phones are going off. And her big thing is that like with a lot of you know leftist politically correct issues that we run up against in the nonprofit world, you know we have all these judgments, and most of the conversations that are about this, like you said a couple times when you started, no judgment, but you know maybe don't be you know on your laptop or whatever. But so often when we have this conversation, it's very black and white, and, and several people said that that it has to be one or the other. And and Anusha's point is that like the reality is is that we're all in the in the middle, and so we have to find a way to make it okay at work and to get some things done at home because we're all doing that. We can't be in Tahiti, you know, or you know, working and online all the time, and, and so we need to lean towards the middle. And, and it's possible to do that, but it's just mindfulness in the middle instead of abusing. Well, I think that's totally, totally right on. I mean, we 
we can't check out. We can't, you know, we can't um, totally be averse to all that stuff because that actually, you know, being averse creates suffering as well, like you're saying. So, um, so I think that there are a lot of practices that we can take on. Um, so I think what might be valuable is I, I continue on. I have quite a bit more, but we have about 20 more minutes of the our time box here. So uh, why don't I, um, I'm going to move forward, but really with the intention of looking at ways of merge, you know, where the two interact. You know, because that seems to be what's emerging in the space. Like how can we be, how can we be present and be plugged in and, and bring awareness to like all this stuff out. All good? Yeah. All right, cool. So um, I think this one's key. It's not about time management. It's about attention management. In fact, this is the big takeaway, I think. Um, as we can, if we're aware of our attention, our time stuff will get handled. And we will take care of the things that are most important, and we will take care of ourselves. And we know that under duress, we rise to the level of our expectation, or we, we fall we don't rise to the level of our expectations, we fall to the level of our training. So, which means we need to up our level of training when it comes to awareness. Uh, this is really key. We have a biological um, rhythm. It's different for everyone, but in general, it looks about 90 minutes on, 20 minutes off. So peak in 90 minutes, come down in 20 uh, and uh, if you want more information about this, this is Tony Schwartz in the Energy Project. He talks about this. Uh, the practice at work would be plan your work in you know, four or so, um, maybe five, but I would say four 90-minute sessions. That was sort of what a day looks like it, with 20-minute breaks in between or 30-minute breaks. Um, and that way you'll get the four most important things done or the one most important thing done over a period of four 90 minute sessions and you take time to come back to yourself and take care of yourself. Managing your energy is more important than time. Energy is more important than time. So. Uh, I think we've talked a lot about that. You know, it's so how can we not get overextended? There's five tips for not getting overextended. Mm -hmm. um, learn to say no. <laughs> uh, ask for help. Most things can wait. Schedule me time. Keep your calendar and set limits and boundaries. I had three sessions that I was gonna that I got accepted to at the NTC. Um, I realized at a certain point that I was really committed to this one, and the other one started to feel like burdens, but it's something I had to do because I to it and NTC was really and Tana was really great gracious and let me hand off the sessions to people that I selected and I helped generate the sessions but I didn't have to moderate them. So uh, this works. You know not everything you think you're committed to you're committed to. You can ask for help. Alright, we'll do this one. This is cool. So this is an exercise. Uh, give me a little crowns. Uh, <clears throat> so this is called the uh, four seven eight or relaxing breath exercise. Uh, it was developed by Daniel Wheel or um, what's his name, uh, Doctor Wheel, uh, Andrew Wheel. Thank you. Um, so uh, actually, this slide probably tells it better. So what we're going to do? You're going to put your uh, your tongue on the upper part of your mouth, like right behind your teeth, like that soft tissue right behind your teeth, right? And 
uh, I'll just walk through how we do it, and then we'll actually do it together. So the first thing you'll do is you'll put your tongue there, and you'll fully breathe out, so you have an empty lung, right? And then what you're going to do is you're going to inhale on a count of four. The most important thing here is the four, seven, eight. Okay. So you're going to inhale for four. First, breathe out. Inhale for four. Hold your breath for seven. And then exhale completely through your mouth for a count of eight. So I'm going to move your mouth. Inhale. I'm not asking you to do it yet, but just walk you through it again. So you're going to Inhale through your nose, exhale through your mouth. That's the key. Four, seven, eight. Okay? And then we're going to do this four times. It takes about a minute. You can bring this every day, right? In fact, if you're going to take the 20 minute breaks, this is a great thing to do. Or if you're about to get on a special phone call, this is a great way to get present. We'll bring you right here. So you guys want to do it together? All right, cool. So. I'll, I'll walk it through the first one, and then uh, I'll let you continue the pattern on your own. So first, tongue in your mouth, find your teeth, and just uh, exhale through your mouth. Now inhale on a count of four. One, two, three, four. Hold your breath. thing you can do, if you're not going to do 90, 20, 90, 20, you know, but if you're not going to do that, take five minute mini breaks every hour. About 10 minutes left. You are all really, really good at what you do. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. And a lot of the work that you do is thinking work, strategizing, you know, you're really good at that, and you wouldn't be in this conversation if you weren't also desiring something beyond that. And the invitation here is be a leader by starting to do less.
here's some really quick, quick tips to have a more mindful day. Look for reasons to praise your coworker. Say good morning. Use ergonomics. Uh, about a year ago, I switched to a standing desk. Uh, and, uh, Ian switched to a uh, treadmill desk. And, uh, I think there's different ways you can do this. Or switch it up. And I do about half my day standing desk, half my day uh, sitting. environments, a lot of times we focus on what's not working, you know, to the detriment of what is working. So, there's all these birthdays, there's life events, there's milestones for the company, you know, there's things that happen, you know, big projects, big wins, you launch something, and you, you, you know, celebrate. all be the ambassadors of having a mindful office. You know, it's not going to start on its own. It requires someone to hold that flag. You might be the crazy one this year, and next year, you know, everyone's really great, grateful for what you brought to the team. This is, um, this is part of the secret sauce of civic actions. I'll share it with you. Uh, about a year ago, we started this practice. So we're a, we're a distributed company. We have about 30 people and we're all over the country. And most of our work happens on telephones or Google Hangouts. So when we get on the call, every morning we have stand-up scrums, like a 15-minute check-in with the entire team, or it's you know, pods of the team. And what we do is Scale of one to ten, how balanced are you? We don't have a we don't have a metric for it. We don't say like an eight means this, a six <laughs> means this. It's so some people or a six means the same thing as an eight for different people. It doesn't really matter. The, what matters is you're bringing attention to something, right? So we get on a call. There's eight people on a call. It takes up all about thirty seconds. We go around. Aaron, I'm feeling an eight, and blah, 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 doing my check-in, right? And everyone does their thing. And what you'll begin to notice is eight, 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 all of a sudden, check-in, someone's a five, right? Like on the, on the next day. It's like, oh, um, I noticed that you're a five. Is there anything going on? Yeah, my kids are sick at home today, and I don't have a sitter, and I got a lot on my plate. And then all of a sudden we could have a conversation of like, well, what can we do to take something off your plate? What can we what can we do to like bring your balance up to a six or seven? And it's like, and that like, and just having the check-in. <laughs> that's, uh, that's my five minute mark. Um, so just having the, uh, the awareness of where people are at and, and you kind of understand it. You know, over time, you do this for a while. You get people's baseline, and then you understand when they drop and when they go up. And oftentimes, like, I'm a nine, but what happened? You know, I'm a ten. Oh, I'm just feeling great today. I don't know. I'm on fire. Like, awesome. <laughs> I want some of that. So um, uh, I shared this with a, a friend, um, a new 
friend that uh, works at Google. He's like, I'm bringing this to my team at Google. And I was like, awesome. And I had this feeling, like, if I could plant one thing today, you know, like, amongst all, if everyone took this back to their teams, I think it, that in itself would be transformational on the version of the team. So if you have any questions about this or any of this, you know, you can contact me and I'll share the specifics of how we do it. Do one task every day that doesn't require a computer. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> you can even go outside. Uh, you're not chained to the desk and you're not chained to the monitor. You just aren't. Like those are self-imposed limitations, I can promise you. Um, this one's really cool. Uh, I learned this from Holacracy, which is a whole management uh, process, which I don't have time to get into, but if you're feeling something, especially if you're attuned, you know, a really great way of communicating it is the, this phrase, I have attention, right? Because it's not saying like I have a problem, something wrong, but it's just like you're creating a space, like I'm feeling, I have attention. And, and then, if you, and especially if you don't have attention and you bring this to the team earlier, so you're like, hey, if anyone has a concern, call it attention, you know, we can do this, and then let's create a mindful dialogue about it, right? It doesn't put, it, I'm responsible for the tension, I have it, right? And then we can have a conversation as opposed to burying it. Um, so, all right, I have a, I'm just gonna click through a bunch of slides and uh, we'll, I work from home, this is really important. Um, have a transition ritual. There's something that actually is very positive about having a community. It creates a separation between work and home life. Mobile devices and our always on world has like removed the transition ritual. Uh, if you bring a transition ritual into your own work, like just end of your day, step outside, take the dog out, you know, whatever the thing is. Um, be do the breathing exercise at the end of each day. It's no more than a couple minutes. All right, this we didn't really get into this, and I think there's another key aspect. So I'm just gonna bookmark it. Um, sleep is critical. Most people, 90% of people, need eight hours or more sleep. And, you're, and you operate subpar if you don't have it. Um, when you're in front of a screen, uh, it prevents you from your mind shutting down, like uh, physically. Like you, you're getting the light um, as if your body thinks it's still daylight. So turning off the screen a couple hours before you go to bed, or at least an hour before you go to bed, don't use TV to go to bed, and uh, and get better sleep. You take on this challenge for you know seven days or fourteen days, getting eight hours sleep. I promise you, it will change your experience of life. Uh, and obviously, our the mindful use of technology. So now I'm really going to play through them. <laughs> I'll, I'll make this slide. Back. This is like cell phone rings, ring one, pull out your cell phone. Ring two, notice who's calling. Ring three, take a deep breath. Ring four, answer. Answer after your breath. So you don't need to get your phone. You don't need to get your phone call on the first ring. <laughs> you can silence it. You, know, you know, press the button on the side. It turns off the ring. The call is still coming through. Use it as an opportunity to take a deep breath. One thing I do with my daughter um, is uh, we have this, we do deep breaths. And we, we just you know, before we sit down for dinner, it's kind of like our grace. All right, everyone, take a deep breath. Everyone, take a deep breath. 
<laughs> so, um, whatever your intention is, and I think you brought up some good ones, you know, whether we're going to be mindful, whether we're going to be the one that's going to bring up the presence conversation, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of us here. This amount of people could really change the space of the conference, and if we all set some intention about bringing some level of mindfulness to it, I think we really can. So, that's my invitation to you. Um, if you're interested in mindfulness meditation, one really great program is MBSR. It's Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. It's an eight-week program. Um, programs all around the country that teach it. Um, increases your immunity. Uh, I mean, everything that you get out of, out of meditation, you can get eight weeks in this program. It's all Energy Project, I mentioned them. Lots of good resources on that from Mindful Office. The Wisdom 2.0 resources, the videos, a lot of things. Um, the uh, Facebook feed is actually really good. A lot of cool stuff, the articles, like at least one a day. Uh, Dr. Dan Siegel, he does a lot of great stuff. That's where I cribbed a lot of that from. Huffington Post uh, has a whole lifestyle section on meditation now. There's a lot of great posts. And actually, Ariane Huffington has become like a really big uh, meditation advocate, which is amazing because it's the sixth largest site on the internet. So having like a voice like that is phenomenal. Um, there are a whole bunch of mindfulness apps um, for meditation. Insight Timer is one I use. Um, but, and then actually, the Huffington Post just did an article like this week on eight different apps. There's one called, another cool one called GPS for the Soul, which is um, uh, guided meditation. So if you want some support, and you're really just sitting, and there's a, it's an audio-visual experience, and people can create them and upload them too. So next steps, wherever you're at, just accept yourself where you're at now. It's totally cool. We're all on this path together. Thank you, everyone. This is awesome. Cool. Now you can pull out your phones and rate this section. <laughs> Continue the conversation. <laughs>